All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emily Mitzel. I'm with Nelson Laboratories. I've been with the company um, about 11 years, and for the last 10 years, I've specifically focused on this topic. And so it's, I'm very passionate about it. I, I've been, um, we've been the leaders of the industry since TIR 30 came out in um, 2003. And so this is, there's a lot going on with this topic. This is a very, um, very important aspect of the FDA of what they're looking at for a lot of medical device companies right now. So in today's talk, we're going to be going over the necessity and basics of the cleaning and disinfection validations on reusable medical devices. Uh, we'll also be going over some very specific information from the FDA on testing non-patient contacting devices and also testing simulated use of devices prior to the cleaning and disinfection and sterilization validations. So I'm gonna go over some basics on how to perform this type of validation to give you an example of how to, basically what to think of everything as you go through each process. But first I'm gonna go into some in-depth information on how important cleaning validations are. So we see a lot of issues in healthcare facilities of not being able to fully clean medical devices. And this comes for many reasons. Um, it, whether the validation is performed appropriately, and also whether the healthcare facility can perform the cleaning procedures that are necessary for reusable medical devices. Here's, some, um, here's a picture of human tissue that was found in an arthroscopic cannula. Here's a picture of um, a bristle that was found inside an arthroscopic shaver. So that shows that the cleaning process was performed, but in that process, a bristle was dislodged from the brush and was never removed during the rinsing process or the rest of the cleaning process. Here we can see human tissue and other debris that was retained in the surgical suction tube. And surgical suction device that was cut in half that was packed with debris. Now, we don't want any of these things used on us or any of our loved ones or, or anybody. So we want to make sure that these medical devices are fully cleaned in between patient contact. Uh, here's a video posting. I, I know I wouldn't have time today to um, show this video in this short presentation, but it was featured on the Today Show just a few months ago about, how, about the importance of cleaning and, and disinfection and sterilization validations with the issues of um, infection control and so on. So this was a little good um, video from the Today Show. I know you can still pull it up on the Today Show if you are interested. So there's a number of guidance documents that kind of uh, determine what should be performed in this testing, but there's no real standards associated with this testing. The biggest, or the, the most recent information came from the FDA a little over two years in their draft guidance document. It's been over two years, like I said, and they still don't have any movement on a non-draft document, although they are following this to the T. So it's really important, to, you know, if, if anything is submitted to the FDA to make sure that it is in complete compliance with this draft document. The other two documents that really define what should be tested are the Amy TR-12 and the Amy TR-30 documents. They're fairly newly um, revised in the last couple years, so those are pretty much up to date also. So. That has a lot of good information associated with this type of testing. There's also a lot of new guidance coming up from the Amy groups and ASTM, and they are specifically focused on endoscope reprocessing, a lot of talk about human factors in making sure that we are um, pr providing medical devices that are easy to clean, easy to use, um, that sort of thing. Also, very, um, more consistent instructions for use. All medical device manufacturers have different, their instructions for use are in different formats and so on, and the Amy Group is trying to standardize that to some extent. So we'll, we'll see where this goes. I know it's kind of difficult to get everybody on board with something that's standardized. Uh, there's also some new working groups with ASTM, although they're not moving quite as fast as the Amy Groups, but they, there are a couple, um, a couple new guidances that are coming from that, that group also. 
So basically there are three steps to medical device reprocessing. And this begins at the point of use, which is usually in the surgical setting, and that is includes kind of a pre-cleaning at the bedside. And this is this all this can remove any of the debris and prevent the drawing of any type of soil onto the devices. Next, the devices are moved into a central processing area where they are thoroughly cleaned in a dedicated cleaning area. And then after that, depending on what the device is and how it'll be utilized in the, in the human, it'll be disinfected or sterilized um, for, for the intended use. So I'll be going over the basics of how to perform a cleaning validation and everything to think about when, when doing that. So first, the purpose of cleaning is to render the device safe for handling by healthcare professionals or prepare the, usable, the reusable device for, so that it's, um, so it's ready for additional reprocessing. So the, basically the four steps in a cleaning validation are the contamination, which equals the surgical procedure, the cleaning, the extraction of the device to make, to get everything off of it, and the residual testing to make sure it was clean. So first we need to determine how the device will be used in a clinical setting. So is this device a critical, semi-critical, or non-critical device? Um, these are spalding classifications that you can find pretty much in any guidance or regulatory document, um, but it, it, it determines kind of how, what, what, um, what residuals we should test for and how we should perform the cleaning validation. So I've got a few pictures here. Uh, we are just using scissors and in this information just to um, protect all of our clients' medical devices. But here is one example of how we would contaminate a device. Now this time we were using a blood spoil, so this would be a device that would be utilized in like the chest cavity, where it would be fully bloodied in the process. And so we want to make sure that we get every kind of nook and cranny in there um, contaminated. We also want to actuate the devices as they would be used in the, in, the, in the surgical setting to make sure that the blood penetrates any areas where, where appropriate. We always make sure the device is set in the soil for the de determined amount for the surgical time. And then the dwell time. Now this is a horrible picture. We don't, we don't want our central processing areas to look like this, but some do when they get busy. So in this aspect, this has been a difficult part of um, determination for the FDA and for medical device companies and for us by all means testing these. But uh, so we always recommended to keep the devices wet in between the contamination period and the cleaning proce procedure because that is what medical device companies put in their IFUs for the most part. Now the, cert the central servicing people were stating that there is no way that all medical devices all the time stay wet. Sometimes they dry out when we have cases like this. So now the FDA is requiring a lot of medical device companies to test um, to test worst case scenario and to make sure that the contamination is fully dried onto the devices. This is causing a lot of issues with medical device companies because their normal uh, procedures for cleaning aren't sufficient anymore because the d devices, there, the soil is fully dried onto the devices. So that's one issue that we kind of go back and forth on. So between a dwell time of say 30 minutes to sometimes we are holding devices after the contamination process for 24 hours or even more to make sure that that contamination has dried on fully. This is also causing issues with um, testing microorganisms in this process, so, because um, the microorganisms die off and then you don't have a starting titer to show that you actually killed or removed the amount of organism from the process. So this is just a picture of an automated a washer disinfector. One thing to keep in mind is, like I said before, with standardized instructions is to make sure that whatever washer disinfector is being recommended for the type of cleaning procedure, that we are utilizing the standard cycles in that washer disinfector. We're not just choosing any type of um, soak and rinse, et cetera because we all know that the central service personnel aren't going to put a standard or a specific cycle for each type of medical device that go through. They're just, you know, they're loading it up to the fullest and running the cycle. So we need to make sure that those are standardized. 
Visual inspection is next. After the cleaning procedure, we want to make sure that the devices are free and clear of all soil. One thing to note is that um, previous guidance documents have stated that we should perform a visual inspection with a naked eye. And now we are looking more at if we should use magnification, using a boroscope, how else are we going to see those internal components like, like the pictures that I showed earlier. So that's getting to be more important. I know a few hospitals have incorporated this into their areas, but very, very few. So they're really relying on the medical device manufacturers to make sure that this happens via in their internal labs or test labs, et cetera. So it's a very important part of it. Next, you extract the devices to ensure that we're removing anything off of the devices, whether it's the positive control device or all the clean devices to make sure everything was fully removed in the cleaning process. This can occur a number of ways depending on the device type and also the residuals that we're looking for. Um, it can be performed by sonication, manual shaking, orbital flushing. We need to make sure that all lumens and all cracks and crevices, all areas that have um, screws and, and so on are, are also flushed thoroughly to make sure that we're getting everything off the device that we possibly can. All these processes need to be validated to make sure that we're that that process is best for that type of device. And then also it's important to perform this on devices that, that we can disassemble, or if we can't disassemble the devices, if there is some way that we can cut them up and, re, you know, and flush every crack and crevice, which is a little difficult with the expense of a lot of medical devices, but it is um, the best, best scenario for that. So there's a lot of different options to test when making sure medical devices are free and clear of anything after the cleaning process. We can test by this by using bio burden, so testing for any organisms. So we'll put the organisms into the test soil, then we'll test for them at the end of the process. We can also use this by testing protein, hemoglobin, carbohydrates, total organic carbon, um, detergent residuals, making sure we're rinsing properly, and also testing for endotoxin. Now all these types of um, markers, we need to ensure that we put these on the device first of all. So that would determine what test soil we're utilizing and that sort of thing. But we also need to think about how the device is used in the, in the hospital setting. If the device is going to come into contact with cerebral spinal fluid, we want to make sure that we're testing for endotoxin. Um, if the device comes into contact with any sort of blood, even if it's just nicking a mucous membrane and that sort of thing, it's always good to test for hemoglobin. And the top marker that the FDA is looking for is protein. So, you know, if, if we're just doing an overall um, very basic approach to a cleaning validation, we always recommend to test for protein and hemoglobin first and then testing the other components depending on how the device is utilized and what the testing is, where, where the testing is going after that. So the other thing that we need to determine is acceptance criteria. This needs to be determined, be determined prior to the start of a cleaning validation. And this is a little bit difficult to get the exact numbers that are appropriate. TIR 30 has some basic recommendations in that document, but the problem with those is they are based on one study that was an endoscope. So it's not a lot of information. So a lot of medical device companies are going off some historical data and so on to determine what their acceptance criteria is. But the biggest thing for that is to make sure that they're justified. So whatever is determined by the acceptance criteria is, is justified. As with all the other parts of the cleaning validation, what soil is being utilized, what testing markers are being utilized, et cetera, just to make sure that those are documented. A lot of times we find when the FDA has questions from a medical device manufacturer on the cleaning validation that we have performed, so to speak, um, that their question is, not necessarily that the medical device manufacturer did something wrong, but they're questioning their thoughts and intentions behind the cleaning validation itself. So to make sure everything is fully justified is really the, the way to go, whether that's in internal documents that you keep at your facility or if it's documents that you, know, you actually send to the FDA. That's, those are the biggest questions we get and that we can kind of help with and the justifications on that. All right, I'm gonna quickly go through um, disinfection validations. Now these are different because 
for the disinfection validation, we're looking, we're, we're going to be utilizing a clean device. So the, the device has already gone through the whole cleaning process, and now we're testing to see if the liquid chemical disinfectant can properly clean, or excuse me, properly disinfect the device. The three types of disinfection are uh, low-level disinfection, intermediate-level disinfection, and high-level disinfection, depending on how the device will be utilized. These go with the, the Spalding classifications of the non-critical device, the critic, uh, or excuse me, um, the non-critical device, the critical device, and the um, high-level critical device. So for this method, we are not using the blood soil like we would use in a cleaning validation. We are using droplets of microorganism in a bovine serum. And these are determined by the acceptance criteria of each level of disinfection. Um, so for the high level disinfection, we are looking at a six log reduction of mycobacterium. For the intermediate level disinfection, it requires a three log reduction of mycobacterium and a six log reduction of vegetative organisms. And for the low level disinfection, it requires a six log reduction of, of um, vegetative organisms. So the next steps to this process are, are very similar to the bio burden process is, is that we are extracting the device, we are performing the bio burden testing, uh, then after that, the plates are incubated, enumerated, and then log reductions are calculated. Disinfection residual testing is also extremely important for the disinfection validation. This is to test to make sure that there are not any residuals of detergent that are or detergent or disinfectant that are left on the device after this process. This can be determined by a number of ways. It can be determined either by a minimal essential media test. And that's probably the quickest and easiest and cheapest by all means. Or else we can look for the, the exact disinfectant that was used in the, in the evaluation. So we do this by performing a UV vis test and we determine the higher level of disinfectant and then we can test for any kind of remote you know, residuals of disinfectant on the device. So this is a very important aspect of di disinfectant testing. So for validations, for disinfection validations, again, they should be predetermined and justify it, justified by the manufacturer. This is a little simpler. There's a lot more um, information out there for disinfection validations. There is an FDA class two guidance document for this that specifies the organisms and the log reduction criteria for this. And I can, I can give that information to anybody who's interested. And also ST58 from Amy has more specific guidance on the acceptance criteria for disinfection validations. Now, one of the things that have just come up very recently is a very important aspect that the FDA is absolutely requiring for many device, medical device manufacturers that have kind of thrown us all for a loop. <laughs> um, they are requ they're, um, requiring cleaning and disinfection validations for non-contact non-patient contacting devices. And this is everything under the sun, basically. We have been testing everything from um, computer keyboards to garbage cans to everything in between. And it is, it's been very difficult for, um, for that testing to occur, if you can imagine testing garbage cans for cleaning validations. <laughs> but also, um, it's, we've also had a lot of kickback from the FDA. One, one issue that we had with a client was um, kind of a, a keyboard stand that was in the room, but it was actually pretty far away from the patient. And they were requiring a, a, cleaning, a cleaning and disinfection validation for that device. But they, and it was a large, large computer monitor. But they also did not like the fact that we performed the extraction with a swab. And there really isn't any other way. It's not like you can immerse that type of device or, or perform the extraction any other way. So we're, we're working with the FDA to, to um, do everything we can to satisfy their needs and also to, um, with the medical device manufacturers, to get everything through the FDA as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. But this is something that's really new within the last couple months and, and quite interesting to us, though. I wanted to pass that on in, in this topic. The other part that's been um, kind, kind of coming down the slopes for a while, and we've been really working with more of 
determining the appropriate shelf lifetimes or the use of the end user lifetimes for medical devices. And a couple years ago, we started testing um, kind of bracketing the cleaning and disinfection and sterilization validations and performing them on brand new devices and also devices are, that are used at the, or that are at the very end use of their life so that we know that throughout the whole life, life cycle of that medical device that the devices can be cleaned and sterilized properly. Now what, what we're hearing is that we want devices to go through three or five or ten or 50 cycles of the cleaning, disinfection, sterilization process. This might even include a contamination, dwell time, actuation, et cetera. But to get the devices broken down to a really used state before we perform the cleaning and disinfection um, and sterilization validations. Now this again, like I was saying earlier, has posed um, a little bit of a problem with the normal cleaning, the cleaning parameters and that the devices are a little harder to clean and, and so on. And so it's, you know, it's been interesting to uh, have to increase that cleaning procedure and so on. So that's something to think about. Now when determining what parameters that a device should go through to get to more of a used state, we really have to look at the device itself, what it's made up of. Um, you know, are there any electrical components and really determining what are the really worst case parts of the, the um, actual use of the device versus the cleaning versus the sterilization. Can, is, is it that the um, actuation or the surgical procedure is the toughest on the device when it's moved back and forth or things are um, less sharp and that sort of thing, or is it the chemicals that are utilized in the d disinfection or cleaning aspects, or is it the high temperatures, humidity, et cetera, that are used in the sterilization process? So really thinking about those sorts of things and determining what breaks down the device the furthest to determine exactly what should be utilized to break down the device before the cleaning, sterilization, and disinfection validations. So that was my information today. Can oh, I also wanted to let you guys know that we are in booth 3336, and also we are giving more talks. I go straight from here to give more information on this at 1 p.m. in room 201A, and then we'll also be giving presentations on ethylene oxide and radiation this afternoon. So, yes, thank you everybody for coming.